Um, we just came out of executive session. This is a continuation of our, our, our first meeting of the evening um, where we interviewed candidates. We'll finish that up and then we'll start the reorg meeting in a few moments. Um, can I get a motion to return to public session? I probably should have done that before. So moved, Tom. Tom. 
Second, Robin. Robin. Okay, can I get a roll call, please? Anthony Emmons. Yes. Yeah. Robin McKaylin. Yes. Carolyn Pagorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric's Rowling. Present. Carol Hample. Yes. Laura Simon. Yes. Can I get a nomination um, to appoint a board member for our, va our vacant position? Uh, I would like to nominate Camille Sarciello. Is there a second? Second, Tom. Are there any other nominations? Not hearing any. Can I get a roll call? Oh, I'm sorry, a motion. I need a motion. So move, Tom. Second, second Carolyn. Carolyn. Okay, can I get a roll call, please? Anthony Emmons. Yes. Rob McKaylin. Yes. Carolyn Pagorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric Swirling. Yes. Carl Hampel. Yes. Or Simon. Yes. Uh, congratulations, Camille. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Um, we need to do the oath of office now. Is Camille on? Where's Camille? Camille, are you with us? I do not see Camille on. I do not see Camille. Okay. So maybe we could do that at the next um, the report meeting then? Okay. So we'll skip that part. Can I get a motion to adjourn our first meeting of the evening? So moved, Carol. Carol. And a second? Second, Tom. Um, and can I get a roll call, please? Anthony Edmund. Yes. Ron McKaylin. Yes. Alan Pogorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric Swirling. Yes. Carol Ample. Yes. Laura Simon. Yes. Okay, that takes care of the first meeting. Hey, Mr. Simon. Yes. If if we before we open up the next meeting, if you give me just two minutes, I'll give uh, Camille a call to make sure she logs into this meeting, yeah. and so that she's there to receive the oath of office. How's that? Can we take a a five minute recess sure, and come right fine. back? Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Excuse All me, right. Doctor. Yeah. You and Jason are not going down to the boardroom. Kersley's just down there by herself. No, we're, we're Jason's headed down there now, but we want to call Camille to make sure she comes into the meeting for her Thank oath you. of office. So we'll head down there. Thank yep. you. Yep.
So just, just a friendly reminder. So just a friendly reminder um, for anyone that joined, uh, we are going to start our real meeting in about one or two minutes. Our, we just ended a previous special meeting to interview uh, for a board vacancy. So we hope to get started in a few minutes. Sorry for the delay. Remember to not unmute. Gotcha. Camille has just joined us. Welcome, Camille. We're, we're going to start with York in about one minute. If you want to just uh, mute yourself. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our reorganization meeting for the 2021 fiscal year, um, calendar year. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being held in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act and is open to the media and the public. Notices were duly posted and the meeting was advertised in the Hunter and County Democrat and Courier News. Formal action may be taken. Um, can everyone please stand for the flag salute? Go ahead, you can get started. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So my first act uh, is to go through the election results from November 3rd. Um, we had three vacancies on the board, of which we had three candidates run for the board. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Carol Hampel uh, for her re-election. Uh, Ray Egbert was elected, but uh, resigned his position, and we had a special meeting to appoint Camille, who's present this evening, and Elizabeth Fiore, uh, who is joining us this evening uh, for her first uh, three-year term. So congratulations, all three of you. Um, at this time, um, I'm going to administer the oath of office to Camille, as well as to Carol, um, as well as Elizabeth. If uh, Camille, Carol, and Elizabeth can all unmute. And if you can please repeat after me. I state your name. Hi, Camille. Hi, Carol Hampton. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That, that I will support. support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith. And I will, and bear, I will bear true faith. And I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And, and allegiance to the same. same. And to the governments. And, and to the governments established in the United States and this state, established, established in the United States and this state, state, under the authority of the people, under, under the, authority the authority of the people. I state your name. I, I Carol, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly, do swear, solemnly swear, swear that I possess the qualifications. That, that I possess qualifications prescribed by law, prescribed, prescribed by, by law for the office of member, for the, for office, the office of, of member, 
of a board of education of a board of a board, board of education have never been convicted of a crime or offense i have never, have never been convicted of a crime or offense listed in listed, listed in NJSA 18A 12-1. NJSA 18-12.1. Something. <laughs> and I have not been disqualified. And I have, and not, have not been disqualified. As a voter pursuant. As, as a voter, voter pursuant, pursuant. To statute. To statute. To statute. And that I will faithfully. And that I will, and I will faithfully. Impartially, 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 and justly perform, and justly perform all duties of that office. All duties of that office, office, according to the best of my ability. According, according to the best of my ability. Congratulations and welcome to the board. Thank you very much. It is not easy to take the oath like that. Just so you know. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, we will not do that again. Um, so the next part of this meeting is going to uh, take roll call um, for the two new board members, um, Camille and Elizabeth. Uh, you would stay here as you are both present. And then for the remaining items on the agenda, you can vote yes, no, or abstain uh, for anything that you uh, have on the agenda tonight. Uh, it's going to be a very short reorganization meeting, but we are going to have an ethics presentation um, by our attorney. So for right now, I'm going to do roll call. Um, okay. Anthony Emmons? Yes. Elizabeth Fiore? Here. Camille Cercelio? Here. Carolyn Bogorski? Here. Andrew Saunders? Here. Thomas Wallace? Here. Eric Swirling. Here. Carol Hampel. Here. And Laura Simon. Here. All are present. Uh, the next act of the reorg meeting is to elect a president. Um, we do not need a second. We only need a nomination. But for now, can I get a motion to uh, elect a president and a second? I'd so like move, Tom. Can I get a second? Second, Carol. Yeah. Um, is there any nominations for board president? Remember, you do not need a second. You simply need to state your name and who you would like to nominate. Yes, this is Eric. I'd be my pleasure to nominate Laura Simon for president. Thank you. Um, is there any other uh, nominations for president? Uh, not seeing any, I'm going to close nominations. And uh, can I get a roll call? Anthony Emmons. Yes. Elizabeth Fiore. Yes. Camille Cesaro. Yes. Carolyn Bogorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric Swirling. Yes. Carol Hample. Yes. And Laura Simon. Uh, that passes. So, Laura, congratulations. You are the new board president for 2021. And I will now hand over the imaginary gavel to Laura to proceed with the rest of the meeting. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next uh, uh, pass for the report is an election of a vice president. And I have um, a motion. So move, Tom. Second, Carol. Okay. Um, are there any nominations for my friend? Yes. I, yes. It would be my honor to nominate Carol Hample for vice president. Thank you. We have um, one nomination. Are there any other nominations for vice president? Not hearing any. Um, we'll close the nominations and we'll have a roll call. Anthony Ammons? Yes. 
Elizabeth Fiore. Yes. Camille, Camille Cercello. Yes. Carolyn Bogorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric Zerling. Yes. Carol Ample. Yes. Laura Simon. Yes. It's always weird voting, voting for yourself, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to the reorganization, um, I need a motion to adopt R-1 through R-5. So moved, Carol. <clears throat> Second, Tom. Um, can I get a roll call, please? Yes. Elizabeth Fiore. Yes. Camille Sosal. Yes. Carol Pogorski. Yes. Andrew Saunders. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. Eric Swirling? Yes. Carol Hample? Yes. Laura Simon? Yes. yes. Um, we have a superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Uh, welcome to uh, our really two new board members. Um, Elizabeth and Camille, I really look forward to working with you on the board. And welcome back again, Carol. It's great to have you back. Uh, serving us on the board and congratulations to both Laura and Carol uh, for your nominations and elections and board leadership. Um, tonight is our reorganization meeting, which uh, calls for us to do our code of ethics presentation. We're joined tonight by Stacy Cherry, our from the firm Fogarty and Hara, who are our board attorneys, to review with you the code of ethics for board members. Um, the reason why we wanted to uh, have everyone, including you, Camille, who I just talked to on the phone here tonight, was because this is an important presentation that uh, is important for new board members particularly to hear, and is your, your first piece of orientation uh, into board operations. So I'd like to introduce Stacy uh, to begin her presentation, and Stacy, I can present so that you can see your audience in case there are questions. Uh, so I'll just bring your presentation up on my screen, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight um, and welcome to the new board members. It's my pleasure to be here, even if only virtually. Um, you know, I think that board member roles are uh, certainly the most important part of what we're going to discuss tonight and the fact that you are giving of your time to be so involved in your school district you know, speaks to your dedication to the district and I can certainly anticipate that um, you'll appreciate the hours that Jonathan has given me tonight to present to you so that you'll be fully abreast by the time we finish around midnight and uh, we'll uh, proceed from there. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we certainly will not be here that long. Um, no, I do want to go over with you um, generally some of the things that are um, you know, relevant for board members in terms of your roles. Um, we're going to talk uh, specifically about the School Ethics Act, and we're going to go over some of the things that are most likely to come before you as board members uh, so that you're aware of what those are when they may come up. And I don't have to be anywhere near that long. Uh, certainly, if the board members have any questions as we're going through, uh, the reason that they're presenting for me is so I can still see your faces um, and you can stop and ask me a question as we go. And we can always answer questions at the end. If you could turn to the next page, we're going to talk about, obviously, the board and the members. We're going to talk about voting, uh, what the requirements are for that. Uh, the types of hearings that are held at the board level, so things that will come before you as board members that you'll be making decisions on. The Open Public Meetings Act and the Open Public Records Act, which are two statutes that uh, have a significant role in terms of board members' um, actions at board meetings, as well as things that the public are able to access both by being able to be present in the meetings and hear your discussions, but also having access to documents that are related to public functions. We'll talk a little bit about confidentiality and the things that you're responsible for keeping um, confidential as a board member, some social media 
uh, information in terms of when you're going to speak on behalf of yourself or when you're speaking on behalf of the board and then the School Ethics Act and conflicts of interest that go into what you can vote on, uh, when you can participate in certain activities of the board like negotiations and things like that. If you could turn the page. So the first thing to really understand is what your role is um, as a board and then as board members. So your basic duties and powers are defined in the statutes, which are 18A, that covers all of um, what are the education statutes that relate to school district operations. And so the general powers that are delegated to boards are to enforce the rules of the State Board of Education, to make, amend, and repeal rules for government and management of the schools and their employees, and to perform all acts and do all things consistent with the laws and rules of the state necessary for the lawful and proper conduct, equipment, and maintenance of the district. And what it really comes down to is um, what you're going to do in terms of overseeing the district as board members. And we'll get into those more specifically if you can turn. So as a board, you really only function when you're in session in terms of taking action on behalf of the district. So certainly you have times where you'll have committee meetings, um, which are meetings of small groups of members of the board. But anytime you are going to take action, you have to have a quorum. So you have to have a certain number of members present in order to uh, participate and take action as a board. That's important for when you are... Um, meeting in terms of your committees, if you have a quorum present, then you're subject to the Open Public Meetings Act and the members of the public also have to be able to be present and you have to follow the rules related to that. You have to hold your meetings at least once every two months when school is in session. You have to start by eight o'clock at night. If you don't have a quorum when you're supposed to begin, you can adjourn until nine o'clock. But if you don't have a quorum by that time, you have to adjourn and then you have to reconvene the meeting within seven days. So it's important as board members to do everything you can to be present so that the board does have its quorum available for your board meetings and so that you can take the action that you need to take that night and don't have to rejoin. If you could turn. The board has specific responsibilities that are within its purview. So making policy, developing plans, looking at what your outcomes are, but the management of the day-to-day -day school operations is with your administrators. So what they say is the board members are responsible not to administer the school, but to see that they are well run. And so you don't have administrative responsibility in the school district, but you oversee the operation of the district. And those uh, operations are delegated to the school officials. So in particular, we look to the superintendent who administers the district and is responsible for being the chief school administrator. Obviously the superintendent keeps the board informed of what's happening and makes recommendations to the board for things that would be within the board's purview. The business administrator typically oversees business and maintenance, preparation of the budget, fiscal plans, and being the accountant and purchasing agent for the district on behalf of the board. But the key there is making sure that the board is focusing its efforts on developing the policies and plans for the district, not administering the day-to-day -day operations. And board members tend to get themselves into ethical issues related to overstepping that boundary. So when we're looking at school ethics decisions where a board member has been um, not following the requirements of the School Ethics Act, it's often because they have stepped over that line into the administration of the day-to-day -day actions within the school. If you could turn the page. The relationship between the board and the administration is meant to be cooperative. Obviously, sometimes there are differences and it can become adversarial, but ultimately the goal is to work cooperatively. So board members sharing their concerns with administration ahead of meetings is often helpful. That way the administration can respond um, with the ability to look into what the board members' questions may be prior to the meeting. Um, and also keeping in mind what matters are appropriate for discussion in public and what matters, what matters are not. And those are the things that are governed by the Open Public Meetings Act, which we'll get into as we go through. 
If you receive as a board member a complaint from a member of the public, board members are to withhold their comment on those, refer the inquiry to the superintendent, determine based on the superintendent's response to that if um, it's been addressed. If it hasn't and the superintendent or the administration that the superintendent delegates it to does not resolve the issue, then potentially the board could take action at a public meeting after the administration has not addressed the public issue. So as a board member, when things come to you, and, and they will, you'll have concerns raised to you by members of the public, um, parents, et cetera, um, they'll come to you with a concern those should be directed to the administration so that the administration can look into it. Um, if they need to speak to teachers or staff about whatever that concern may be, and then keep you apprised of the resolution of that so that it is handled and you know it's been handled, but it's not handled by the board unless the administration does not address it. You can turn the page. So as board members, you're basically working as a unit. So obviously each board member may have different opinions about the action that you're going to take. And that's why there's time for discussion about the different votes that you'll take on different issues. However, ultimately the board votes and acts as a unit. So when you ultimately decide as a board what your um, action will be, the president typically speaks on behalf of the board um, and can request other board members to uh, make comment if need be, but to ensure that there's a smooth board meeting, that it's not a uh, back and forth between the public and uh, the board members. The president runs the meeting, speaks on behalf of the board, presents whatever the board's uh, ultimate decision is based on the votes uh, to the public, and that is the action that the board takes. Uh, while each of the board members may ultimately have different opinions that are expressed as part of the discussion, at the end, the action that's taken is taken by the board as a unit. Um, board members often have their own personal experience and expertise that certainly can inform the decisions that you're going to make as a district. Um, it can be very helpful, for example, if you have somebody who has a financial background and is serving on a committee that deals with uh, the budget, that background can have um, you know, insight into things that the district may um, value in terms of forming its opinion. But ultimately, your background as an individual member does not necessarily mean that that is the course of action that the district will take or that an individual member is able to um, steer the board in one direction only and monopolize the discussion because of their background. So um, you have to focus on using what valuable knowledge you have from your expertise and background to the benefit of the board, while keeping in mind that you're still a member of a unit that's going to take action as a whole, um, and focusing on the entire district and its student administrators and uh, employees versus for the benefit of individual students or your own. Uh, you can turn, thanks. Um, board members are representatives of the district. And so it's expected that they'll behave professionally um, as members of the board, especially when you're uh, speaking on behalf of the board. You are concerned with all issues that come before the district. Um, and we have to make sure that we're looking towards resolving things in a manner that is effective communication, that addresses issues that are really before the board, uh, and that is uh, conducive to coming to solutions for the district. So if there are uh, personal conflicts between board members, we you know try to resolve those to the best that we can so that when the board is uh, speaking in public, it is more of a team mentality. Um, there are so many times that there are rumors or innuendo or um, comments coming from social media or anecdotes, um, often even um, uh, anonymous submissions that there's no basis for. Um, and so we wanna make sure that anything that comes in is certainly reviewed if need be, but is not just relied on as uh, it comes in as a rumor. Um, and then 
really trying to focus on even where there is a disagreement with other members of the board. And there certainly are times that board members disagree and sometimes disagree passionately, that we can express that passionate disagreement while still maintaining a sense of decorum with our other board members who are working together as a team for the best interest of students. When it comes to your action as a board and you're working as a unit, you can only take official action when the board takes a vote on something. That can only occur when you have your quorum present. So your board is five members. You can take a vote by voice, by a show of hands, by roll call, but no matter how you take your vote, it has to be clear how each board member voted. Um, and it has to be clear to the public and in the minutes what each board member voted for. Um, just so you know, abstentions don't count as votes. So basically you are not voting for or against a vote. Uh, you have to be present to vote. Reading policies and bylaws do not allow voting by proxy. So you cannot ask somebody to vote on your behalf if you can't be present at a meeting. You have to be present. You can turn. All motions that are passed by the board have to at least have a majority of the board members who are present and voting. So for example, you could have a board meeting that has five members present, which is a quorum, and then you could have three members vote to affirm the motion. That would be sufficient to pass most um, items that would come before the board because you have a majority of the present members who constitute a quorum. However, there are some acts that require more than a majority of the present members. So for example, you have to have a majority of the full board in order to appoint certain officials like the superintendent, the business administrator, uh, to appoint, transfer, renew, or remove staff members, teaching staff members. Um, for tenure charges, determining if they're sufficient, you have to have a majority of the full board. Um, and something like withholding a salary increment. And often the items that um, involve having the majority of the full board present um, are some of the fiscal items that come before a board and then some of the um, more pressing personnel issues that come before the board. A couple of the items that come before you that involve board uh, review and then decisions are certain hearings uh, that are held at the board level. So um, HIB appeals, which are harassment, intimidation, and bullying come before the board. Long-term suspensions of students come before the board. Residency appeals are heard by the board. Grievances from staff members are heard by the board and non-renewal or what are called Donaldson hearings are heard before the board. So all of these things are items that the board considers and then takes action on. And I'm gonna go through some of those a little more specifically, if you could turn the page. So harassment, intimidation and bullying is, um, now we're, I think about nine years into the um, implementation of the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights, which deals with harassment, intimidation, and bullying in the schools. And there are specific procedures that the administration and the staff have to follow in terms of investigating acts that could be deemed harassment, intimidation, bullying against students. And once those investigations are concluded, the superintendent has to provide a report to the board letting you know if it was deemed to be an act of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and what um, consequences or other remedial actions were imposed. The parents of either the victim or the offender have the opportunity, if they want, to request a board hearing to try to overturn the results of that decision. And if that happens, then it comes before the board for um, adjudication. That hearing is not a formal hearing like you might think of in a courtroom, but it is an opportunity for parents to present why they believe the decision was incorrect. And after the board has the opportunity to hear whatever the parents have to say, in addition to reviewing the reports from the district staff and potentially even hearing from the district administration or 
members of your staff, like the anti-bullying specialist who conducts the investigation, the board has to vote to determine if you're going to affirm, reject, or modify the superintendent's decision. And you have to make that vote regardless of whether the parents submit an appeal. So sometimes um, you'll have a parent who does not appeal, the board still at the second meeting after the uh, first uh, time the superintendent lets you know about the HIB, you have to vote to decide if you're going to affirm, reject, or modify that decision. But sometimes it occurs after a hearing. So in this instance, not um, too dissimilar to your role in general, your job is not investigating the uh, alleged act of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, but it's more supervisory to review the investigation uh, that was done and determine if you're in agreement with what the results of the anti-bullying specialist report found, um, which is also reviewed by the superintendent. And then you make your vote on if you're affirming, rejecting, or modifying it. You can turn the page. Another hearing that comes before you is a long-term suspension of students. Any student who is being suspended for more than 10 consecutive school days, which is called a long-term suspension, has particular due process rights. They have to be given a formal hearing either by the full board, a committee, an administrator, or a hearing officer. Um, every district does it a little bit differently. After the hearing is held, then the board has to issue a decision on if they are going to extend the suspension beyond 10 days. And for every board meeting after that, if the suspension is going to continue, the board has to vote to continue the suspension. Now, importantly, if you have the hearing delegated to either a committee or the administration, then the full board has to consider the report of that committee or administration before taking its vote to continue the suspension. But a student can only remain suspended by continued vote of the full board. Uh, you can turn that. Residency appeals. The board um, is um, always, is there a question? The board is responsible for determining um, after report by the superintendent if a parent appeals the residency determination. So what happens is the district may um, find out either through an investigation or a report by someone else that a student is not living within the district. The uh, administration puts the family on notice that they are intending to disenroll the student because they are not residents of the district. And the parents have to be given the opportunity to appeal that determination. And that appeal comes before the board. If the parents appeal it, they have the right to appear before you, present evidence about why they are residents and are entitled to a free education in the district. And the board has to review those facts and issue a decision about whether the student will be disenrolled or whether the student will continue to be a student in the district. So that is something that comes before you to determine. Uh, you can turn the next page. The next one that comes before the board are grievances. Grievances are brought by staff members under the collective negotiations agreement between the district and the uh, association. You have staff members with the ability to file a grievance about interpretation, application, a violation of the collective negotiations agreement, a policy or administrative decision. So typically it's when a staff member disagrees with how the administration is implementing part of the contract. It could be something like a teacher doesn't believe they're getting the number of prep periods that they're entitled to. Um, and they will then file a grievance saying that um, they believe that their rights under the collective negotiations agreement have been violated. There are steps that they're following as they go through the grievance procedure. So generally it involves first appealing to their direct administrator, then it goes to the superintendent, and then it goes to the board. And once it comes to the board, you hold the hearing, you listen to what the administration has to say, what the staff member has to say, and then you issue a decision determining if you are granting the grievance, that is that you agree with the staff member's complaint, or if you're denying the grievance. And that's something that can be appealed later to uh, an arbitrator. 
Uh, next one, non-renewal hearings. So when you have uh, employees who are not tenured, that is that they're not um, automatically going to be reemployed for the next year, they can only be uh, reappointed after the superintendent recommends that they receive a position and a contract for the next year. And then the majority of the full membership of the board uh, votes to reappoint that member. If the superintendent does not make a recommendation for somebody to be appointed, then that person is deemed non-renewed. A non-renewed employee is entitled to request a statement of reasons from the superintendent, that is asking what the reasons are that the person was not given a contract for the next year. And they can ask for an informal appearance before the board, which is called a Donaldson hearing. So this is a non-adversarial proceeding it is basically the staff member's opportunity to convince the board members that the superintendent was incorrect when they did not offer or recommend that the staff member be given a contract for the next year. Um, you don't testify under oath. There's no cross-examination. Um, and ultimately, the board, if they agree with the staff member, can pass a motion to offer the employee a new contract. It's one of the only times, I think it's the only time, that the board can essentially override the administration's decision not to offer a new contract. So if you particularly like a certain teacher and you think that the superintendent should recommend them for reappointment, but the superintendent does not, the board cannot on its own offer that employee a new contract. The only way that that employee could potentially be rehired is if the employee requests the Donaldson hearing and then convinces the majority of the board that that person should be rehired uh, when the superintendent has not made that recommendation. Um, you can turn. The Open Public Meetings Act governs um, your board meetings always. But it also has impacts in terms of uh, making sure that you're not taking action outside of board meetings that could be considered meetings that would be subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. And essentially it means that the members of the public have the right to be present and to witness and to have all the details about what the board deliberates on, you know, what forms their policies, um, and to be able to see um, that in action. So they have the right to be present at meetings meetings and they have right to adequate notice of those meetings, which is why at your reorganization meeting you adopt um, a schedule of when you're going to be meeting for the rest of the year. When you want to have a special meeting, we have to give notice within a certain amount of time, 48 hours in advance, with notice to the public about what will be on the agenda for that special meeting. Um, and so those are all things that the board is required to comply with typically administered through your business administrator who puts out those notices and things. If you turn the page. So what is considered a meeting? So any gathering in person or as we're seeing now remote, attended um, by or open to all members of the board where you're gonna discuss or act as a unit on public business. So if you have less than a majority, less than a quorum, it's not a meeting. Um, if you have three or more public bodies present, um, like at a convention, that's not considered a meeting. Um, what's important to, to know is that sometimes um, if you're not careful, you can be having a meeting through something like email without realizing it. Um, now, if you all happen to show up at the same Christmas party or something, that is not a, a meeting of the public um, because you're not there to discuss or act on public business. Of course, if you all gather in a corner and start discussing public business, that would be something that would uh, potentially be a public meeting and a violation of OPMA. Can you turn the page? So when we're talking about email, and email is certainly um, used very regularly and is a good way to stay informed. I know the administration keeps the members updated, um, but it can be considered a violation of OPMA if you're discussing matters that are about the board's function um, and you're not open to the public. So you have to make sure you limit your communication to four or fewer members. Um, it's not triggered if there's less than a quorum, and, and make sure that you are um, not violating those requirements. 
if you turn the page. I'm, excuse me, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is anybody else hearing that too? Yes. I think Doreen just fixed it. Okay, thank you. Okay. So typically a single email sent to um, all of the board members would not be a meeting because you're not acting. So for example, if you are sending something to all the board members for informational purposes, like you have an item coming up, you know, that you're going to speak about and you want all the board members to know some particular piece of information, but you're not beginning or starting a discussion about it, then it would not be subject to OPMA. But it's important that if you send something like that, that it does not end up being subject to OPA, OPMA by board members responding and beginning a discussion, either um, not replying all so you don't prompt that back and forth that would be considered discussion, or just making sure you refrain from responding to emails from other board members that are informational. One of the ways you can do that is the person who initiates the email, making sure that they state at the front, you know, this is for informational purposes only, please do not respond. We can discuss this at the board meeting um, so that you are sure that you are not violating OPMA and not opening the door to having a discussion outside of a public meeting. You can turn the page. So OPRA is the Open Public Records Act. OPMA gives access to the meetings. OPRA gives access to the government records that are made, maintained, kept, or received in the course of official business. So things like the board minutes are subject to OPRA. Um, things like emails related to board business by board members are also government records that are subject to OPRA. It doesn't matter if that email is on your district email account or if it's on a personal email account. So it is important to keep that in mind that just because you use your personal account does not mean that it is not subject to OPRA. If you use, um, if you are discussing board business um, between board members, then it is subject to OPRA regardless. Text messages have also been held to be government records when they're related to public business. So it's important to keep in mind when you're communicating electronically that that communication is subject to disclosure under OPRA, unless of course it meets an exception. And there are many exceptions to OPRA in terms of what can be disclosed. For example, um, if it was related to a student or a personnel matter, um, there are redactions that would be done before it would be disclosed. However, um, OPRA does give access to a significant amount of information, especially about board deliberations. If you could turn the page. In your role as a board member, you are prohibited from disclosing confidential information, things that you learn as a member of the board. Um, for example, um, if you learn during a closed session that a teacher is being suspended pending an evaluation, a psychiatric or other medical evaluation, you can't tell anybody about that, even if you, for example, have a child who's a student of that teacher. Um, if you are deliberating about reorganizing the district from um, you know, having pre-K to four in one building and five to eight in another to having um, you know, a, a pre-K one, two building, a three, four, five building and a six, seven, eight building, you can't disclose that discussion to others um, if it's being still discussed um, you know, confidentially so that a friend of yours who's moving to town can decide if they want to do that, if they're going from, um, you know, more uh, uh, change schools to neighborhood schools. Um, so anything that you learn as a board member has to be kept confidential um, until it becomes obviously public. Uh, you can turn the page. So we always recommend, uh, especially when it comes to social media, being cautious and discreet about what school issues you're gonna talk about um, on Facebook or in other forums. It certainly can lead to you know, rumors, um, uh, avoidable conflicts. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that you know, as board members, we are you know, professional in whatever we do post, um, but you should keep in mind not to post anything that would violate uh, district policy that is disrespectful to others or is defamatory, um, certainly not disclosing anything that is confidential, 
communicating with other board members back and forth um, in a chat in some way that could be potentially an OPMA violation or responding to postings about the board or district business as a board member when those should be referred back to the superintendent to be addressed. So if a member of the public posts a complaint to you in a social media platform, rather than responding to the person in the public, you would refer that complaint to the superintendent to be addressed. If you could turn uh, the page. So uh, in terms of the School Ethics Act, so as a member of the board, you have certain ethical obligations. You are um, entrusted with the respect and confidence of the people that reside within your township. You are supposed to avoid the appearance or the violation of that public trust or where it creates an impression that you would be violating the public trust. The specific ethical obligations are that you will uphold and enforce the laws, rules, and regulations, that you're going to promote the educational welfare of children, regardless of their ability, race, creed, sex, or social standing, that you're going to act in an official capacity for purposes of policy making, planning, and appraisal, and only after consulting with those who are affected, that you're going to act not to administer the schools, but to see that they're well run that you're going to recognize that authority rests with the board, not with individual members, and that you won't make personal promises or take private action that compromises the board. So you can't do things on your own that would be something the board has to do. Uh, you can turn the page. You are supposed to maintain independent judgment, free of special interests, partisan politics, self-dealing, or personal favors. You have to hold confidential information that if disclosed would needlessly injure individuals or the schools and provide accurate information to the district administration and staff. You're responsible for appointing the best qualified personnel available in consultation with the superintendent. You have to support and protect school personnel and proper performance of their duties. And you refer all complaints to the superintendent and act on such complaints only if there's no administrative uh, action. We would turn the page. The next part is about conflicts of interest. So there are certain arrangements and relationships that are forbidden. So you cannot be involved in any business or activity that has a substantial conflict with your public duties. You can't uh, use your position to secure unwarranted privileges, advantages, or employment for yourself, immediate relatives, or others. So for example, you could not uh, look to have your child uh, appointed as a teacher in the district when you're serving as a board member. You can't act in an official, excuse me, you can't act in your official capacity where it involves an immediate relative or a business organization in which you have an interest. So for example, if you and your spouse own a landscaping company, then you would not be able to bid on doing the landscaping for the school district. Uh, you can't accept employment, even unpaid, in any capacity that would prejudice the member, you, in exercising your duties. You can't accept any gift, favor, or loan with the understanding that was given to influence or discharge of your duties. You can't use your non-public knowledge for financial gain, so things that you learn as a member of the board, you can't then turn around and use for your own financial gain. If you could turn it. So one of the things that comes up, um, and I don't know if any of our board members happen to have a parent who, uh, a family member who um, is potentially uh, conflicted, but we often are looking at board members and whether they are conflicted from certain actions within the district. So immediate, board, immediate family members are your spouse, your dependent children residing in the same house as you. Relatives, are uh, the board member's spouse or the member's spouse, the members or the spouses. So your parents or your in-laws, your step-parent, your child, your child-in-law, your stepchild, your sibling, your step-sibling, your half-sibling, your aunt or uncle, your niece or nephew, your grandparent or your grandchild. So if it is yours or your spouse's of any of those, whether by blood, marriage, or adoption, it's considered a relative. And we're gonna go to a chart that's gonna show you all the times that you're conflicted because of those potential relationships. So if you turn to the next page, and this is 
you know, probably the easiest way for you to look at it. If you have um, a spouse, for example, who is currently a member of a local uh, union, um, a, a teacher's union, for example, then we look, can you participate in negotiations over the teacher's contract? And if you look at the chart, no, you cannot. You also cannot vote to ratify the contract and you cannot vote in anything that relates to issues with the superintendent because the superintendent oversees uh, people who are in that union. If you look um, further down, for example, if you have a relative who is a current member of a similar union, not the local union, but for example, is a member of a teacher's union in another town, then can you participate in negotiations? Yes, you can, unless there's another conflict, which I'll get to in a second, that are much more particularized. Um, you can vote to ratify the contract and you can participate in issues related to the superintendent. So this chart can be very helpful if you have an immediate family member or a relative who is a member of a local union or a similar union to determine if you're able to participate as a member of the board in negotiations over the contracts, if you can vote to ratify the contract, or if you can participate in issues related to the superintendent. And if you turn the page, these are the extra kind of issues that we look at in terms of there may not be a per se conflict as on the other page, but it's more likely that there's a conflict if the out of district relative, so for example, a relative who is a member of a union not in your district is an officer in the NJEA or the local education association is on their district's negotiation team or has a leadership role which could influence the outcome of negotiations there. And if those um, or any of those factors uh, are present, then if you go back to the other page, the answers that are yes, that have the asterisk would then be turned to no. So if you had, for example, a dependent child who is a current member of a union in another town, typically you would be able to vote to ratify the contract. But if that dependent child is on the negotiation team in the other district, that yes would become a no and you would not be able to vote to ratify the contract or to participate in issues related to the superintendent. Um, you can turn and turn again. Um, now, what is important, while um, we're always cautious about providing information on social media or in letters to newspapers, things like that, just because you're a member of the board does not mean that you give up your private rights, really First Amendment rights of free speech, in uh, expressing what your opinion is personally. So what's important is if you're going to present something um, either on social media or in a letter to the editor or something like that, you want to make sure that you identify that you're a board member, that the letter or whatever you wrote was written not as uh, not on behalf of the board and not as authorized for, by the board. So the board isn't giving you authority to present this on their behalf. It is important to include only accurate and non-confidential information and that it doesn't compromise the board. But typically if a board member wants to make some kind of statement to an editor or on Facebook or something like that, they'll include a statement saying, you know, I'm a member of the Board of Education. However, you know, this post is not um, authorized for the board, nor is it written on behalf of the board. It is my personal opinion um, and then state whatever that opinion is. Some of the, oh, you can turn the page. Some of the things that board members can get themselves in trouble with in terms of their actions are taking unilateral action. So not referring complaints to the superintendent or attempting to take action themselves. Um, neglecting uh, stakeholders. So part of your role is framing policies and plans after you've consulted by those that will be affected by them. So taking into consideration what um, your stakeholders have to say is an important part of your job as a board member. 
um, attempting to assert authority over staff members. So board members don't have managerial authority over staff and have to leave those duties to administrators. So even if you have heard that a staff member has done something that you would find unacceptable, it's not your role as a board member to address that issue with the staff member. It's your role as a board member to refer that back to the superintendent to address. Uh, referring friends for um, employment, you can't use the schools for personal gain or the gain of friends. The superintendent is the one who has to identify and recommend the best candidate based on the applicants and participating directly in district administration. So ensuring that the uh, appropriate administrators are uh, the ones who are overseeing what is uh, actually administering the school, not um, having the board have direct contract that could be considered doing more than just making policy or planning or appraisal. Uh, and I believe that is all. So I know it's quite a lot, and especially for new board members who are just embarking on this role. Um, there are uh, trainings that are available to board members um, through our office, but you know also through school boards uh, to really get into the different uh, areas that impact board members and what your roles and responsibilities are. And I hope that this gives you, um, if not all the answers, at least some things that will um, you know reflect. Uh, that you will be piqued to uh, address should they come before you. So if you're looking, if you're going to be, for example, on the negotiations team, you'll think back and say, wait a minute, I remember uh, when we were talking about this, I need to think about the fact that I have a cousin who is um, in a teacher's union in another district. Let me just review that before I agree that I'll be on the negotiations committee where we have you know, a, a hearing before the board on a particular issue. You know, What's my role as a board member in considering how we're going to vote on that particular issue. Um, and I know the administration is certainly there to support you uh, in all those uh, areas. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. I did have one question. Um, for the recusal part, uh, are you only referring to school unions or what kind of unions are you referring to? So typically we are, yes. Um, when you're looking at the chart, you can see the um, local union is referring to actually being in your union. Um, when we're looking at other unions, we're usually looking at teachers unions. Now I do sometimes have um, teachers who are like a relative, but in another state. So they're not in the NJEA, but they're in a union in another state. So we would look at that more particularly. But it's not just, um, you have a family member who's a, in the electrical union, something like that. Anything else? Okay. And for uh, can you can you hear me? For I can. New, okay. For those new uh, board members, please know that this is not the end of your training. It's not just this one presentation. There's an orientation that will set up for you. Uh, I believe it's later on this week, and there is some training that's required by New Jersey school boards uh, over the course of this spring that really does go into much more detail on many of these issues. So please know that this, I guess, Stacy, 45 minute or so presentation is not your only training. So if there's something that you feel like you missed, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to you. We'll make sure that you have all the training you need. So, and certainly if there's ever a question or something, you know, we're here and I know the administration is here to, to answer any of those questions that may come up. Certainly. So Stacy, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we appreciate your time. It's good seeing you again, albeit virtually. And um, that will conclude my superintendent's report for the evening. Thank you very much, Stacey. Very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, we are now open to the public. Our uh, limited action items on the agenda. Not hearing it. Um, we didn't have correspondence since the last meeting. 
Moving to the minutes, can I get a motion to adopt 2.01 to 2.02? So moved, Carol. Second, Tom. All right. Um, are there any changes required for the minutes? Not hearing any. Um, can I get a roll call, please? Anthony Ammons. Yes. Elizabeth Fiore. I'd like to um, abstain from the minutes vote. Camille Cerciello. Can't hear you. You have to unmute quick. Um, should I abstain as well from the minutes? Probably. Okay. Yes. 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 I'll, I'll Carolyn Pogorski. Yes. Yeah. Andrew Saunders. He had to hop off. Thomas Wallace. Yes. yes. Eric Swirling. Yes. Carol Ample. Yes. Four Simon. Did you say me yet? Yes. Can you hear what the um, I'm going to say that, please. Uh, motion passes. Unfinished business. Is there anything you need to bring up? The only thing I would say, if you go back to R2, where we talk about the committees and the delegates, um, I will be sending out a list of the committees, um, and then you would just email me back where you feel you have, um, you know, a background in or you have interest in, um, and then I'll put those committees together, and um, we'll send those out as soon as possible. So you'll be hearing from me on those committees and the delegates. That's all I have on that. Any other unfinished business? Okay, new business from the oh, board. Actually, uh, I have a question. Um, so would Gina and um, Camille, I'm sorry, Camille and Beth have uh, access to the school board's um, uh, conference from last year? Do they have, will they have access to that? They, they will have access um, at some point, but not in the immediate. Okay. I just want to make sure we get them that information so they can go through any training that they're interested in. That's a good idea, Carol. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other? Laura, just as a, this is Jonathan, just as an FYI, our next Ed Tech Committee meeting is Monday the 11th, uh, just so you know, just yeah. timeline-wide. I mean, if we need to postpone, we can, but I, I think Monday the 11th is the next one. Yeah, I should be able to get it done within a couple of days. We'll work with Carol, okay. and then we'll reach out. It's all good. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Um, do you want to move into the draft board agenda that you put together? Yeah, sure. See, there's there's a green committee meeting tomorrow in case any of the new members are interested. If the, if if any of the new members have any interest, just email Jason and he'll provide a link. Wonderful. Okay. Um, did everybody get a chance to review the formats that um, Dr. Hart put forward? <clears throat> Revising the format okay. for the board agendas. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're under new business. You got it. Um, you know, the, the goal here was was really twofold. One is when we when we hopefully get back to be in person. Uh, you know, when, when we have to print paper copies of the agenda and we leave them here in the board meeting, just something that has more text on it and less white space to be more economical and more efficient as far as the number of pages or paper that we use when it comes to printing agendas, when we have to have print agendas. And then the second part is to have the agenda format um, 
you know, read in a way that follows our meeting progression. Um, but uh, like an example, uh, format number three had the roll call at the at the end, at the very end of the particular agenda item. So for example, you know, personnel, you would have the committee report, you'd have all of the agenda items, and then the roll call would be at the end. Um, and finally, really just visual appeal for our, our agendas, just, you know, trying to use more of the space on the paper um, and create some consistent fonts and consistent margins on the paper. So those were just some thoughts and ideas. I don't know if anybody has any strong feelings toward one over another, or if they have any feedback for us to take back before our January meeting in regard to looking at the agenda format. I personally liked number I, three. Um, yeah. I, going through the agendas and you know having to notate everything, um, it would be really helpful to have the roll call at the end instead of going back to the beginning of where the motion is. So that that's that's definitely a plus. And less white space is good too. And saving I, I, paper. Saving yeah. paper. I, I like to save paper and I like number three as well with the roll call at the end. And I, I was thinking about running, like you, Laura, when you run the meetings, it'd be nice to just kind of go through and not have to mm -hmm. flip through the agenda items and then flip back to the agenda to do the roll call. Right. Yeah. I agree. I liked um, I liked the third one. The only um, other thing that I noticed was that with option two was that it, we got it down by two extra pages. So was that um, was that a margin thing? Could we could we do anything more with margins to incorporate some of the information from two into not information, but some of the ideas from two into three or what is that just not possible because we included the roll call I, I think it's really just because we included roll call and, and it went back and forth do we does do we want jason to have a separate paper with all of the roll calls or as the board president or the person presiding over the meeting to actually have the roll call on the agenda because the roll call is on the agenda now we thought that that's kind of the habit we're into and that to have that at the end and i think having inserting those roll calls and creating enough space in between each roll call just added another two pages is there any benefit to having the motion at the top and the roll call at the bottom the way it actually happens oh yeah well, um hang on So if I'm looking at number three, because I'm hearing that we like roll call. So if you look at number three, uh, let's just go to minutes. The motion at the top reads right now, you know, B2 is motion to adopt 2.01 to 2.02. So if I'm presiding over the meeting, I imagine that I get to approval of minutes. I read motion to adopt 2.01 to 2.02. And then there are the motions. And then we have, oh, I see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see what you mean. Okay, so put the actual motion and the second, like the blank lines up with the motion. Right, yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Good call, Carol. Yeah, I, that, that was good, Carol. <laughs> I ran one meeting and that was my, like, where do I write this stuff? So I hear what Laura's saying. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any other feedback? So I, I, would, are you I, I, I would offer feedback. Um, I tried look, clicking on the link earlier and I, I requested access. Uh, I, I wasn't able to to get in. Sometimes, because um, I have multiple emails with work and everything, um, just look in your upper right hand corner and make sure you're on the right email. Just do switch. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I don't. I, yeah. I when I when I try to click the link, it does. Then it does give me that. It says like my default email, my personal email. Um, not at the top, not in the top corner, but, but right sort of in the, in the middle of the page and I try to switch account and I still see the same, um, request access mm -hmm. button, but so I'll, I'll have to, you know, look into it. Um, and you know, I'd be happy to review and, and, and give, give feedback. Um, uh, but I will share, yeah, I appreciate the effort to 
right? Reduce, reduce, you know, paper use and, and, and such. So yeah. obviously make it easier for everyone to run the meeting efficiently. So maybe in the interim, um, Dr. Hart, could you maybe email him the documents yeah. directly? Mm -hmm. I didn't so, have access as well. Right now, since my computer is right in front of me. Sorry. This is Doreen. I didn't have access as well. So I understand what um, Anthony's saying. I had to request it as well and did not receive it. So. Yes, and please, uh, this is our please forward them. Okay. Okay. So do you, do you want to wait to get that feedback before making that decision, Dr. Hart? Uh, yeah, I have no problem with that. I can, I'll re-email everyone uh, okay. full board now that we've had discussion. Um, it seems as though we have a, a, with a minor tweak, a slight leaning toward option number three. Mm -hmm. um, and I can hold off and we can proceed. Uh, if I don't hear anything, we can proceed with number three with the minor tweak. If we start to hear more feedback, I can bring it back in January. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Okay. Anything else under new business? Um, well, back to, I think it was R4. R4, I think. Uh, R4 is what yeah, do, Oh, the form. Do we need the form? Do we need to print out the form and send it to Jason, or how are we going to do that? Yeah, I was going to drop my Scan it. Not back. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, my secretary, is going to mail each of you, your forms, because there's certain um, things that have to be filled out by certain members. So you're each gonna get something in the mail in the next probably seven days with a return envelope. And then you simply, you know, sign it, return it. Um, if you want, you can print it and bring it in as well or print it and mail it, it's up to you, but you will get a copy in probably seven days. Thank you. Okay, any other new business? All right, um, we're now open to the public. Anything on or off the agenda? Were there comments at all? No. Since we don't have Robin anymore, does anybody want to manage comments? Uh, aw, we'll, assign. <laughs> we'll assign it with the committees. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Carol. Carol. Second, Tom. Um, all right. Can I get a roll call, please? Anthony Emmons. Yes. yes. Elizabeth Fiore. Yes. Camille Cerciello. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, Carolyn Pagorski. Yes. Thomas Wallace. Yes. yes. Eric Rowling. Yes. Carol Hample. Yes. Laura Simon. Yes. And I'd like to congratulate both Camille and Beth. Welcome aboard. Hope you made it through your first meeting. It should be a lot of fun. Thank you. I'm very excited to work with all of you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you as well. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And a, Good night, happy, everyone. and a happy and healthy new year to everyone. Happy yeah. new year. Good night, everybody. Stay healthy. Right, guys. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.